Hi, I'm Dennis DiCicco, Senior Editor of Sky and Telescope Magazine here at 2014 Northeast Astronomy Forum, better known as NEEF. And right now, it gives me really great pleasure to be speaking with Al Nagler of Teleview Optics. Al and I have been telescope makers for a long time. In fact, we've crossed paths at telescope making conventions going all the way back to the 60s. But Al's the founder of Teleview, a name that's really well known. And in fact, I want you to give me a little background on how the company okay. got started, Al. Okay, well, great to be with you, Dennis. Same here. Well, as a kid, I was always interested in astronomy, and I went to the Bronx High School of Science, where I was lucky enough to be able to build my dream 8-inch telescope. Brought that to Stellafane Convention, got an award for it, and so on. And that led me into a career in optics with a company also in the Bronx that did research and development for military and uh, industry. And from that, one day, as an amateur astronomer, the boss came to me and he said, oh, how would you like to design the simulator that's going to visually train the astronauts to land on the moon? And I said, what? I think that's OK. And so that, uh, that was a project that really changed my life. Uh, because it also allowed me to see the kinds of fields of view the astronauts saw when they looked through the simulator going upwards of 100 degrees of field of view. Why angle said, field of view? Yeah, that triangular window of the lens, 110 degrees across the corners. So anyway, having seen that, seen the moon and stars and everything at those kind of fields, I said, you know, for my telescope, boy, wouldn't it be nice to have that kind of spacewalk viewing someday? So. I kind of put that at the back of my, my mind, and then the way things progressed, uh, I was able to finally, in 1977, uh, Judy, my wife, kindly uh, left teaching and helped me start Teleview, where I could eventually live these dreams, and that's, that's the beginning of the whole thing. Really? So you started out by making eyepieces? Well, eyepieces, yes. That was the first astronomical product uh, we made. And I had this dream, as I said, of having a wide-angle spacewalk viewing eyepiece. But as a small company, initially starting off in the basement, I couldn't afford uh, very much in terms of uh, uh, activity. So I said I designed the 82-degree Nagler eyepiece, but in order to launch the company successfully, I uh, decided to improve upon the original Plossel eyepiece I've got a patent on that too, and I can show you all the eyepieces here, and let's let's see how historically it, it played out. Uh, first, we had the line of Plossel eyepieces. They have the 50 traditional 50 degree apparent field of view, but I, I was able to improve the edge performance uh, dramatically enough uh, to earn a patent, and that started the company rolling and the success of the name. And that allowed me to invest, since uh, that was difficult uh, working out of your kitchen on the kitchen table, into producing the Nagler eyepiece in 1979. I don't have the original one here, but I have some examples back here of the different Nagler eyepieces. They evolved over the years into many types. There was the original, the Type 2, which we don't have anymore, and the Type 4. Uh, and then the type 5 and type 6. So here we have, for example, uh, one of the more recent ones. This is a type 6, and it's a smaller one, inch and a quarter, and it has an 82 degree field of view. And they have them in focal lengths from two and a half millimeters, very short focal length, up to 13 millimeters. The two and a half millimeters uh, we want for high power with short focal length telescopes like our refractors. The beauty is that it has a 12 millimeter eye relief, which is very comfortable, and that really hasn't been done before in focal lengths that short. So that's been a little more recent, but prior to that, we replaced the other li earlier lines of Nagler's with the Type 4 and Type 5. So the Type 4, which runs from 12 millimeters to 22 millimeters focal length, also 82 degrees, has a unique adjustable eye guard with a long 18 millimeters of eye relief so people can be comfortable 
uh, with it wearing glasses. And then we have the Type 5s, which go from 20 millimeters, uh, uh, sorry, 16 millimeters now, up to 31 millimeters, one of the heaviest eyepieces we've ever produced. That's the 31 Nagler. Uh, some people call that, uh, what, the hand grenade or something. <laughs> So, uh, but th that is, uh, gives us the, large, the largest true field in the Nagler line. But in between, we have in between the Naglers of old, we wanted something in the middle fields of view, and then we developed a wide field which merged into the panoptic, and this is the 41 panoptic, the largest true field eyepiece uh, we've made although the plossils did go up to 55 millimeters to get the largest true field, we're able to do it at a higher power with 41 millimeters with the panoptic. So that's also kind of a heavy beast. So these are the princelings of the wide true field range of Teleview eyepieces. So that covers the early eyepieces, and now let's go on to the more recent generations made possible by coating advances that we've worked with our manufacturers to get to. So you can have a very high transmission eyepieces and therefore use more elements to get exceptional correction, yet maintain the, the throughput, the transmission, the clarity, the whiteness, all of the things that make, uh, hopefully, a, a perfect, enjoyable experience. So it's really modern technology with these new coatings and glasses that's allowing you to exploit these designs to create these never-before types of eyepieces. Well, we're always looking to innovate and expand the potential of what an eyepiece can do, and that's been our ethos, if you will, over the years. So let me tell you a little story about how we got to the ethos, which is the first 100 degree eyepiece ever produced uh, for uh, the amateur community. My son David has been with the company for a long time. He's now the president of the company. Uh, but I was away on a vacation trip, I think, and he said he thought about what can we do to change the nature of uh, eyepiece technology and history the way we did when we introduced the original 13 Nagler which changed everything in terms of the acceptance of high quality wide field eyepieces. And so I was away and David came up with the idea of doing a hundred degree line. And uh, when I came back from vacation, I was a little uh, about it. But fortunately, he worked with my protege, Paul Delakai, who's been working with the company now for over 25 years and uh, working in optical design. He said, Paul, I want to surprise Dad when he comes back with a 100-degree eyepiece. And Paul came up with the design. And when I came back and I looked at it, I said, that's a winner. Let's, let's work on it. And we had all the technical capability. It was just a question of getting it done. And so the very first eyepiece in the new line, because you have to have a whole line, would be the 13 millimeter, so people could exactly compare the, the new technology advantages compared to the best version of the original 13, or at least the 13 Type 6 that we had. Which had been like 30 years earlier. Right, right. So, so we started with the 13, and we expanded the line to get uh, as large as we could with a two inch, and that's the 21 millimeter ethos which also weighs over two pounds. And then we expanded on the other end all the way down to a 3.7 Ethos SX. Now the SX comes from the fact that when Paul was working on it, I saw the design was so good in the 3.7 and 4.7. I said, Paul, that design looks so good. Let's see if we could expand that from 100 to 110 degrees. Well, why do that? It was, to me, it was, to illustrate potentially to people what the astronauts were able to see exactly as they cruised over the lunar surface because that was the very field of view I designed for the Apollo LEM lunar simulator. So here we are coming full circle. And that's why we call it the Ethos SX 
110 degrees for simulator experience because we want the user to know that is the experience the astronauts had looking out the LEM window when they trained for landing. And so that was uh, another, another uh, dream of mine to be able to, uh, to do that. So you've come a long ways from starting on your kitchen table to developing an entire line of eyepieces that aren't just eyepieces, but they have this great history that goes with them as well. But the company's expanded to a lot more things than eyepieces. I mean, you've got other stuff here you want to show me. Sure. Well, first of all, we have uh, Barlow lenses where we've developed our own Barlows. Then we developed an improvement to the Barlow using four elements called the PowerMate, and that keeps the uh, eye distance of eyepieces, the eye relief, constant, whereas Barlows often expand the eye relief and damage the capability of wide-angle eyepieces. So the PowerMate solves that problem. Whenever we have a problem, we just try to solve it and make a universal solution. So in 1989, because I have a fast reflector, I realized our eyepieces are great in terms of imaging with the refracting system I developed in order to test eyepieces. However, when used in a, in a Dobsonian, you have the coma introduced by the parabolic mirror. And eyepieces really can't get rid of that, and therefore you cannot get a really sharp field in a fast parabolic mirror. So then I went on to develop the paracore, which means parabola corrector. And that allows us to get uh, that kind of wonderful full field performance, accuracy, sharpness with large Dobsonians. So that started in 1989 and it's gone further and I had Paul Delacai work on it and the, the most recent version is the Paracore Type 2 which gets us down to F3 capability with large Dobsonians. Now what does that mean? It means that instead of having a tall Dobsonian with a gigantic ladder that you have to climb sure. up on the middle of the night, risk injury and whatever. Now you can completely get rid of the ladder. You can have a 20 inch F3 telescope. 60 properly, inch focal length. 60 inch focal length. Eyepiece right here. Properly corrected for coma with no ladder, but there's another ancillary benefit. That's that F3 telescope has twice the width of field of view of an F6 telescope. So you've expanded the field, you've gotten rid of the ladder, and our eyepieces work, are designed to work with those fast F numbers so you can enjoy the perfection of the eyepieces along with the telescope. So that has been called the new Dobsonian revolution, and we're very proud of that. And it brings in your philosophy from the early of these wide field views. Right, so, so that max, maximizes uh, that potential, and then we go on to uh, also improve the telescopes in, in various ways. But I think maybe we ought to give a little hand to all of the wonderful employees we have that made all of this possible. Well, the and many of them are amateur astronomers like me. Right. And that's why they love to work well, on I was, this stuff. So I was going to say, you started out on your kitchen table and you've grown to a company and you've got a whole lot of dedicated employees. Many of them are amateur astronomers. Well, these are really great accessories, but I know, let's go take a look at the telescopes you've got here at the show. Great, let's do it. All right. Okay, Dennis, uh, this is uh, the smallest telescope we make, the Teleview 60, and it's a perfect telescope for general observing, astronomical, as well as terrestrial, birding. Uh, it can even be used for photography, and it's made to the same high quality standards as every one of our instruments. It'll last forever, nothing can ever rust, and this 60 millimeter telescope surpasses the classic old long focus refractors, giving even better apochromatic performance, color free at high magnifications, yet giving you a wider angle than they ever could. So now you've got a compact package that does it all, from low power to high power, convenient, lifelong quality, and it meets my requirement since I consider myself the lazy, world's laziest amateur astronomer, you, you can go anywhere with it, and that's, that's just the smallest telescope we have. Pick it up and carry it in one hand. Right. All right. Now we move from the 60 to the 76, the next step up, a three-inch telescope, and you remember what those big old three-inch telescopes look like, but this has the same attributes. At F6, it gives you that wide field, 
and has uh, top quality for high magnification. And in fact, this one happens to have a 10 millimeter Delos eyepiece on it, which by the way, can use our Dioptrics, another unique product that eliminates the astigmatism in your eyesight so you can get rid of eyeglasses and just put it on any great many of our eyepieces. That's a good point to make because if people wear eyeglasses, if they need correction because of nearsightedness or farsightedness, you just change the focus. But if you have astigmatism in your eyes, that doesn't go away. This corrector will take care of that. Put it on the eyepiece, you can take your glasses off and observe in perfect comfort. It does one other unique thing. When you mount it, you can rotate it and that adjusts the astigmatism angle correction as well, which you cannot do with eyeglasses. Let's move on to the next one. This is the Teleview 85. Uh, this just expands that principle to 85 millimeter aperture. It's unique in that it accepts, it can accept many accessories because of the balancing, including our unique star beam uh, red dot finder. Uh, and this telescope reached such favor with birders that the Cornell Ornithology Lab rated it the best optics in the world for birding. And that's with a doublet apocrymat. That brings up a great point. As you said, terrestrial viewing, but these are fantastic birding telescopes. In fact, you can use them for all kinds of nature observation. Not only that, we, this illustrates our binocular viewer that we've developed that now brings virtual 3D viewing to both birding and astronomy and maintains the perfection we love to see in our astronomical images. And now we go on to the NP-101, the 4-inch telescope at F5.4, which kind of started my telescope work in the company because I developed a Petzval telescope in order to have a perfect instrument to check the eyepieces because there was nothing around that would allow me to check the eyepieces in that detail. So this has evolved into a four-element uh, system with two fluoride substitute glasses that gives you literally zero color error at, at the highest magnifications, uh, approximately a five degree field, and it's a flat field, so it can be used for imaging as well. That's because I am a glutton. I want the telescope to do everything. I want it visual, I want it convenient, I want it for astrophotography. So anything you could do, given the size of the instrument, that's what we want, and we make them one at a time. One person builds an entire instrument. Uh, we, all of the parts are crafted out of the best materials, and optics and mechanics. Nothing can rust, and these are built for a lifetime, and we have very nice uh, uh, hard cases uh, for all of these. So we try to do everything for convenience, versatility, quality, cover all the bases from wide angle to high power to imaging in one instrument. Right. These are really heirloom instruments, aren't they? Yes, they, they, they last forever. You talk about people who have some of our older instruments 25 years and they're st still going strong. To me, it's the greenest product on earth. It uses no power, does magical things, and lasts forever. Excellent. Give me another example. Okay. All right, and then you so, got your flagship down here. Yes. So this is your flagship. Yes, this is our five-inch NP-127 IS, IS meaning imaging system. So we've taken everything we've learned from the smaller uh, Petzval refractors. We've increased the size of the rear lenses in order to get fuller illumination over larger chips. So this is the flagship, both in terms of imaging and visual, the NP-127 imaging system. So this is also a four element design, excellent color correction, perfectly flat field, and this is the IS so it, it can illuminate the large CCDs. Exactly, up to 52 millimeters diagonal. So those are the big 16803 chips, and obviously full frame DSLR cameras as well. Absolutely. All right. So you also have a version of the 101, which has been optimized for large size chips as well. Exactly, that's our 101 IS system, which we have right over here. And I see this one is decked out with all the accessories. You've got your electric focus motor, precision dial indicator, which all feeds into an automatic focusing system. 
and you also have a nice compact carrying case for this scope. And this is the 101 that will cover the large format chips, correct? Exactly. All right. And speaking of astrophotography, I know you've got something brand new that was just introduced yesterday at the show here. Yes, that's our three inch big paracore for large focuses, but the key is this allows large, fast Newtonians to image with 52 millimeter diagonal chips like the IS system. So we've expanded the potential of astrophotography into large aperture Newtonians for research, development, education, and the ultimate hobbyist. So this three inch big paracore allows large fast telescopes, as fast as F3, to be used for imaging and it has an 80 millimeter back focus which is particularly useful for cameras. You have plenty of room to get a camera and a filter wheel yes, in there. Yes, camera, filter wheels, all accessories and we have additional accessories to allow it to be used with ordinary digital cameras and even to attach the Paracore tunable top for visual use. So here you've got large fast Newtonians that can be used with this Paracore for visual and photographic work. Yes, that's the purpose. So we can have imaging with large telescopes, uh, take the Paracore correction up to that level for large uh, professional sized telescopes with very large chips. Excellent. You know, you have one other astrophotography item here, which is a joint venture with FLI. Would you like to show that to me? Well, what I'd like to do is have my son David tell you about it, because he's the one who set that whole thing up. All right. So, David, can you join us? David, how are you doing? Hi, very well. Thanks. All right. Your dad tells me you're going to tell me about the new telescope system here. Yeah, happy to do so. Let's take a look. This is our new NP127 FLI. It's a modification of the NP127 IS, which I know my father covered. And unlike our other telescopes, which are all multi-purpose instruments for terrestrial, or visual applications, terrestrial, astronomical, as well as photography, this telescope is dedicated for astrophotography. And this telescope was designed around another company's product, Finger Lakes in Instrumentation. It was designed around this focuser, and the idea here is that this is a very solid focuser with a very limited amount of travel. Because of the limited amount of travel, uh, it cannot be used visually. So this is the focuser here. Another aspect to it is that as part of the imaging system, for the NP127, there's an additional corrector lens which has to sit within the focuser itself. That is dictated, that position is dictated by the distance through the focuser, the filter wheel, and back to the chip of the camera. So this is a truly dedicated system. And I just want to remind viewers that we have an interview with the FLI folks so people can see the details of the focuser, the filter wheel, and the camera that's on this system. If you haven't seen it already, I recommend you take a look at it. But So let's get back to the telescope itself. We knew that with the performance of the NP127IS that we had an optical system that could cover the diagonal, the 52 millimeter diagonal of a 16803 chip. Uh, with pinpoint stars to the edge, as these images attest, these blow-ups attest. These are some images taken by our beta tester, uh, Gordon Haynes from Herodford, England, and he's done a fabulous job. The, the concept behind this scope, and, and so I, I gave you the nuts and bolts, but the concept behind this scope is, as anybody who's attempted imaging, knows with the variety of cameras available and accessories, the machinations are tremendous. So as a manufacturer, we have a hard time being able to, uh, to, to make parts for every combination. That leaves it to the customer to have to go source proper spacers or filters and, and match their optics to their uh, cameras. We've taken all of that out. The concept here was to make as plug and play an imaging system as possible, and we succeeded. 
That's what the beta testers have proven to us. So this scope will be on the market soon. And by plug and play, what I mean is that uh, somebody will just get the components from FLI, or if they have them, just get the either what they don't have, either the focuser, or the camera, or the filter wheel, bolt them together, bolt them on the back of the telescope, should be able to then put their telescope on their mount and come out with beautiful flat field images. And we do that by our special alignment procedure that we developed for making this telescope, in which we use very high power to analyze around the edge of the field to make sure that it's uniform. And we can adjust the end of the telescope in tilt until the uh, images are uniform around the edge of the field. And we do that by these adjustment screws here. That's the adjustment screw, that's a lock screw. There are three of them so that you can angle that plate in, any, in whatever orientation that we need. This is a system that is actually on all of our imaging system scopes, the 127 IS and the 101 IS. And what this allows the user to do is if there's any variation in components, because of course there are tolerances in everything. So if the user detects any uh, out of focus stars in the corners, then they can make an adjustment themselves because while we've tried this with many different FLI components, of course, they have many out in the field already, and tolerances build up. So we built an adjustment capability into it. The user shouldn't need it, but it's there should it be it. needed. All right, yes. that's excellent. So David, thank you very much. I really appreciate you telling me about this. Now, if okay. viewers want to have more information about any of the things they've seen here, they can go to your website, which is? Televue.com, T-E-L-E-V-U-E.com. All right, and Al, thank you very much for telling thank, me about thank everything. Thank you, Dennis, very much. Right. Appreciate it. I'm Dennis DiCicco, Senior Editor of Sky and Telescope Magazine here at 2014 NEAT.